right. Uh, let's see. Um, just a second, Hope. Yeah, that looks good. All right. Uh, making a video. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, just a second, girl. All right, I'm coming. Okay, here we go. All right. That's my good girl. Huh? Okay. All right, let's see. It's called um, How to Be a Respectable Heroin Addict in an Unclean World. What? You don't like the title? <laughs> what do you know? You're a dog. <laughs> All right, uh, here goes. <sighs> Hello, good people, and thank you for watching my video. How to be a respectable junkie. Better? Uh, my name's Brian, and uh, I've been using heroin on and off, but mostly on for two years. Now, uh, I've sampled other drugs as well, but it's heroin. Heroin that compels me to speak. I mean, it's what... Uh, Compelled me to find this camera. <laughs> okay, uh, anyway, um, if you are anything like my sweet dog, Hope, say hi, Hope. Really? <laughs> um, you're, uh, you're probably wondering why I would want to make a video about shooting dope. Well, uh, first, I've been wanting to make a video for a while now. Like uh, I watched one the other day on how to fix a dryer. It was really helpful. Matter of fact, uh, taught me how to fix my mom's. So instead of using her money to pay a repairman, I was able to buy this dope instead. <laughs> Thank you. This guy can fix anything 27. But it got me thinking. And what do I know how to do? What kind of how-to video could I make? Well, I know how to shoot dope, so... <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'm not proud of myself. But um, there was another reason. See, I was thinking of my buddy Chuck. Uh, he's a good friend. More like a brother, really. And also, the happiest guy you will ever meet. And see, we roomed together for eight months at this recovery center. And uh, one day, we go to his mom's house to get a TV for our room. And while we're there, we're rummaging through her closet. When she walks in, sees us, and just loses her mind on us. I mean, she goes ape shit. What are you looking for in there? There's nothing you can steal, nothing you can sell. And I'm like, damn, lady, chill out. You have to be so harsh? I mean... We were three months clean at that point. Yeah, no, I don't blame her. I get it. I mean, why should she trust us? But it got me thinking that we addicts need to up our game, be more respectable. So that's what I aim to do with this video. I am not kidding. Oh, and uh, this might be a good time to also mention that I plan on killing myself on Tuesday. So, without further ado, yeah, but that, that's not the point of this. The point is, yes I can, got it all planned out, as a matter of fact. Well, you'll stay with mom. Yes, I realize you're my dog, but trust me, this is best for everyone. Yes it is. Because maybe I'm sick and tired of waking up every fucking morning trying to decide who it is I gotta fuck over today, okay? 
Does that satisfy you? Now may I please go on with my fucking video? Sorry about the language. Uh, anyway. Come on, Hope. Don't be that way. You're gonna be okay? You'll see. Hey, when I'm gone, things will be better for you. Well, you'll take care of each other. Here, um, have a treat. Everyone needs a bump from time to time. There we go. Who's my sweet girl? You are. <laughs> All right. Um, before we begin, uh, let me just, uh, let me just, yeah, there we go. Um, let me just get this out of the way. Um, everyone always asks me why. Like, why do you use? Why did you start? <laughs> it can happen for a lot of reasons. Like, for some people, it can be as simple as they go in for dental surgery get prescribed Percocet and then things escalate as they tend to do when heroin is involved. Or, uh, or they've suffered some sort of emotional trauma and, and now they're medicating it. Huh. Wasn't that dramatic for me? I was like a lot of kids in high school. I drank, smoked pot, got wasted, etc. But I have to admit, I was always curious about heroin. What it was like. I mean, I only knew what I saw in movies. <laughs> Once I graduated though, my drinking started to pick up, as did my other drug use. So, I decided to move down to North Carolina, get away from the crowd I was running with. But then, things only got exponentially worse. I started smoking crack, shooting coke, the works. Once my drug dealing landlord put a bounty on my head for Borrowing a hundred dollars, <laughs> I figured it might be a good time to come back home to glorious Cleveland, Ohio. And I got clean, stayed clean, no alcohol, no drugs, nothing for nine months. Until the night I relapsed, I was drinking and doing coke till 5.30 in the morning, but I didn't even catch a buzz, which was strange. Stranger still was, I had money in my pocket and didn't use it to buy drugs. So instead, I went to a meeting and tell my relapse story. And that is where I meet Tommy. <laughs> he, he's this little tumbleweed of a dude. He's always wearing a hoodie. <laughs> so Tommy approaches me when the meeting's done. I'm thinking he's going to shake my hand, welcome me back like people do at meetings. But instead, he says... You ever try heroin? <laughs> I mean, can you believe that? Who does that? Huh. Tommy, that's who. He is a crazy dude. But he's also real generous. Like, like he'd offer you his last cigarette if you needed it. And nobody does that. So, uh, a few days after the meeting... Tommy calls, asks if I want to earn a few extra bucks doing some landscaping work for this guy from N.A. Sure, why not? So I show up, we're talking, I start telling him again about my relapse, and he says, have you thought any more about doing heroin? <laughs> just, just says that, like we're, like we're talking about the weather. And, and I say, actually, I have. Why, can you get some? Funny you should say that because I have some on the way. <laughs> and that was that. First time I ever used dope. Hmm. Huh. 
But you know, I suppose all roads were leading to that. Because, you know, I was always curious, always looking for a way to, I don't know, feel different. Hmm. Anyway, <clears throat> all right. How to be a respectable junkie. Lesson number one, how to score. <laughs> Nowadays, pretty simple. You can get it anywhere, but sometimes you still have to head out to the hood. And if you're gonna do this, go during the day. <laughs> this reduces your chances of getting beaten, stabbed, shot, or even arrested. Me, I go right after work. Head out before nightfall, get my dope, and I'm all set. So, there's your rule. No copping after dark. Easy enough? Yes? You're welcome. Ha. Lesson number two. Um, mm -hmm. How to shoot up like an adult. First, ah, grab your dope. Our specialty for today is Mexican mud. Good, reliable, does the job. You can count on this. Next. Gather your supplies. Here's what you'll need. Needle. Oh, uh -huh. Syringe. Can. Ah. Cotton. Water. And so, to begin, Take your can and flip it upside down like so. You'll notice I'm not using a spoon. Some people choose to use that method, but I do not because I'm training you to be a respectable junkie. And respectable junkies don't steal their mother's spoons, okay? <laughs> you leave my mom out of this. When you flip the can over, you'll notice that the beverage companies were kind enough to add this dimple in the bottom so we can pour our dope in. Just let me shoot up and I'll take you out. Pour the dope in. Hold on, girl. Then take your syringe and draw water from the water bottle and squirt it into the can to mix with the dope. You can simply flip over your syringe and use the plunger to do so. See how easy? Aha. What we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is a clean needle, unused and unbent perfection. Getting dope is actually pretty easy, but getting one of these, that's the real challenge. When I'm going to acquire a needle, I dress for success. So gentlemen, keep your hair trimmed, your beard shaved, Put on good clothes. That means no shirts with burn holes from all the times you've knotted out. And of course, wear long sleeves because no one wants nor needs to see your abscesses and bruises, okay? That's a clear giveaway and not very respectable, mind you. Next step, head to the pharmacy. Upon entering, be prepared to answer the big question. Why? Uh, I've had juvenile diabetes since I was seven. How much insulin do you take? 20 units every morning before breakfast. What kind? Humulin N. At this point, you've won the game. Oh no, I don't need a whole box because I don't have enough money for that and dope. Just a few will do. Thank you. Never hurts to be polite. We respectable junkies always are. Then we come to the next important step. Drop your cotton or cotton ball, as civilians call them, into your mixture. I'll take you out in a second. Just let me shoot up. If you don't have a cotton, 
Marina, you can use a piece of cigarette filter as I'm doing here. Pro tip, always dispose of cottons after usage to avoid future temptation and suffering. Trust me on that, folks. Then, take your needle and insert it into the cotton. Careful not to hit the can. Don't want to dull or contaminate the needle. The goal is to shoot dope into our veins, not bacteria. All right. Oh, all right. Uh, spot your vein. Uh, you notice I don't bother to tie off. It's a waste of time. Plus, I don't need to pop my veins because, as a friend of mine once told me, and I don't mean to brag, but I have gorgeous veins. Line the needle parallel with the vein, and we're just going to slide it in. But, and this is important, careful not to go through the vein or... What? Look, I, I can't. What, what are, you, are you pissing your bed? Jesus, Hope! I guess I don't have to take you out anymore. Oh, glad this will end soon. Lesson number three. And being a respectable junkie, how not to shoot up in a urine-infested shithole. Take your pup out to pee when she needs to piss. I'm so glad this will be over soon. Anyway, Hope's right. Probably shouldn't do this in front of the kids. That's not what you think. I'm not tripping my balls off right now. I'm not speaking in tongues. I mean, this isn't ecstasy, acid, coke, or, or anything. I mean, it's just, it's an opiate, right? pain reliever takes away the anxiety of living but it's more than that for me it gives me breath imagine you were lying in bed freaking out in the wee hours of darkness and suddenly you lose your breath there's a pillow on your face smothering you you try and fight it off, whoever it is. You're trying to breathe, but you can't, and then you just, you shoot up and... <sighs> Breath returns. You can breathe. Fresh air. I don't ever want to take a sober breath. And I won't ever again. Because once I'm through with this, I'm out. No more hustling. No more scrounging. No more fucking people over. It's a good feeling to know that I'm nearly done with all that. Yes, Hope. I'm serious about this.
Lesson number four, <laughs> I think. Um, how to manage your dope portfolio. <laughs> this is a business. Don't kid yourself. So, if you want your business to thrive, you have to manage things accordingly. You see, when I get dope, I don't shoot it all at once. I parcel it out. Some junkies, they get dope in front of them and they just shoot it all. Not me. I'm a respectable junkie. <laughs> I view the world in $20 increments. That's how much it cost me for a hit. So if I reach a point where I have to sell a guitar and an amp, I'm not getting $40 from the pawnbroker who's ripping me off because he smells my desperation. I'm getting two hits. Every phone I steal and sell to the homeless guy that lives under the bridge, that's another hit. I spend 40 to $70 a day on dope, which isn't too bad. I know a girl, beautiful. She spends $3,000 a week. She makes all that in one night. As you can see, I am not making that kind of money in an evening. And though I consider myself a pretty good thief, it's not how I like to operate because the cash flow isn't consistent. And so, I got me a job. And a respectable one at that. IT, full-time, Fortune 500 company, downtown. Not bad, right? Couple that with the fact that I live at home and don't have a car payment and things are financially sound. Now, would it be cooler if I had my own apartment? Yes. Would I rather not have to answer to my mom? Yes. Is my independence worth me giving up hits? Hell no. Living at home is just good business sense. And when you understand that, you are ready for your next lesson. The more important lesson. Number five. How to protect your habit. Now, even if I didn't need the money, I'd still work. Why? Hmm? If I'm not working a full-time job, my parents are gonna wonder what the hell I'm doing with my life and grow suspicious of me. So, by working, not only am I earning enough money to buy dope, I am fooling my parents into thinking that I am a normal person. <laughs> Normal person. Mm. And so, I strive for rhythm and routine, and so should you. If you don't, you might get sick at the wrong time. Like, you don't want to start sweating and shaking at an important family event, say, Christmas dinner, for example. People tend to notice those things, and when they do, it could be game over. Also, it's not how respectable addicts should behave. I time out my day so I shoot up before work and during lunch. My lunch hour goes like this. I walk 20 minutes to where I park my car. Takes that long because I park in a free spot over the Veterans Memorial Bridge. I mean, why spend three or four dollars a day to park when I could use that money for dope? I get to my car, shoot up, and then immediately vomit. Not all addicts. Hurl afterward, but I often do. For this reason, I keep those little blue grocery bags in my car and I just puke into them. It's a trick I learned from a friend of mine. Now, I'm not completely gross. I do get rid of those bags. Eventually. Then I uh, ride it out for a few minutes and make the 20 minute trek back to work. When I get back to Tower City, when I see all the earthlings eating their lunch, I watch them. I see them, but they don't see me. Not really. They have no idea that I am dying inside. I'm invisible to them. Hey, you, couple who eats way too much Kung Pao chicken. I'm over here.
I wonder what it's like to have a purpose in life. Hope, girl, I love you. I do, but you can't be my purpose. No, not mom either. No one can count on me, okay? And she should have realized that before she even brought you into my life. Jesus. Oh, it's my fucking sponsor. I don't know. If I don't, he'll call back. If I do, who knows what the hell he wants. Shit. Why does he have to be so fucking supportive all the time? Why can't he just... Well. Look at that. Nice. Hmm. All right. All right. Next lesson. How best to show your family you love them. Lie. <laughs> See, Hope here wants me to call my mom and tell her that I'm thinking about killing myself. But that ain't happening. <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. See, when I pick her up from the airport on Monday, she'll know that I've gone back on my word and that I'm using again. But come Tuesday, I'll fade away. And while things will be tough at first, eventually, life will reveal itself to her in ways she never before imagined. And that will be a blessing for her. A gift, because... How can I make you understand? Okay, uh, <laughs> uh, this one time, I wanted to take my mom out for her birthday. I saved for weeks, weeks. Like here I am, gamefully employed adult, living rent free. And yet I was struggling to set aside 50 lousy dollars to take my mom out to dinner. But I had to. One, I had to keep things looking on the up and up and two, She's my mom. And even if I've reached a point where I no longer have feelings, I understand that she still has them herself. So, I need $50 to treat her to the outback. <laughs> this would cover her dinner and a fruity drink or dessert, should she want one. Me, I'd just go with the six ounce filet. Not because it's cheaper, though that's a bonus, but because it's the smallest. You see, dope addicts don't eat. I live off Skittles and ice cream, but can't let her know that. Cause see, my mom has a brother that died of heroin, and if she ever suspected that I was using, what would she try to do? Stop me, of course, and we can't have that. So we go to dinner and things seem to be going well enough, but my mom is unusually chatty this evening even for her, and it uh, becomes painfully obvious to me that I've mistimed my hit. And now all I can think about is getting into my car and shooting up. You see, it was no accident. I made sure that we drove separately because I knew I'd have to use immediately after dinner, but still it's taking long. Why won't she stop talking? Why won't she stop talking? Why is your hand shaking, she says. Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, it always does this. Since when? Uh, sometimes I get nervous and, uh, well, what are you nervous about? No, uh, I don't know. I I'm not. Didn't I tell you about this before? No, you should see a doctor. Yeah, I will for sure. And now it's becoming too much. I have to leave. Please finish your dessert so I can get some fucking dope in my veins. I know, son of the year. Mercifully, we finish, I get in my car, drive about a mile down the road to this industrial complex and pull in there, just holding the dope in my hands and I start to feel better, but still they shake and like I told you, I don't waste time tying off. So I start to fix up dope, pop can, water bottle, which are hidden under the seat, right? Pour dope, mix water, reach for the cotton end, spill it, spill it, shit. Fucking spilled it. Are you fucking kidding me? 
There's no fucking way this just happened to me. God damn you, Mom, why did you have to keep talking? I say for weeks to take you out for your birthday and now I spill my dope? Thank you very much, Mom. I am fucked. I am so fucked right now. I have no choice. I have to break one of my rules. But really, it's heroin that makes the rules and then breaks them. I drive down to the hood, fucking 10 at night. This should be good. I just hope I don't end up like my buddy and get a gun stuck in my face. But mercifully again, all goes well. I get the dope, park on a side street, start to fix up. Can, dope, water, syringe, mix, cotton, needle. Don't spill, don't spill. Please don't fucking. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <sighs> Breath. I live to see another four hours. Happy fucking birthday, Mom. And you wonder why I want to kill myself? Next lesson, uh, how to, um, how to know, fuck it, when to come clean to your loved ones. This is a last resort, but eventually they're going to find out. For me, it's because I was out of money. I was into four different check cashing places, constantly robbing Peter to pay Paul, my dealer was done fronting me. <laughs> My uh, plan to rob a gas station <laughs> went south and I had no way to get dope. So, what's a poor junkie to do? Mom, I need $150. You're getting high again, aren't you? There's no sugar coat in this, so, yep, on what? Heroin? <laughs> She's not expecting this answer and it throws her. Like I told you, she lost a brother to this shit. And then, just to be sure she appreciates the gravity of the situation. My dealer knows where I live, and if I don't pay him today, I don't know what he'll do. <laughs> now the truth is, my dealer wouldn't do a thing because he doesn't know where I live. And he just happens to be a pretty respectable fellow himself who just happens to smoke a lot of weed and sling even more dope, but I digress. Long story short, she calls my dad, who objects at first, but then agrees to $100 if I agree to meet them both at Lake West, where I will check myself into detox. At this point, I'd agree to cut off both my nuts if it meant I could get a hit. And then, my mom, my poor mom, I want to go with you. Yep, you heard that right, folks. My mom wants to go with me to pay off my drug dealer. <laughs> I can just see my dealer now. Who's this, Brian? My mom. Hmm. She cool? Yes, I'm cool. And I'd be a lot cooler if you weren't selling smack to my dear, sweet, innocent boy. And incidentally, does your mother know what you do for a living? <laughs> Thank you, but no. Fortunately, my dad talked her out of it. So, I get good and high and meet them both at Lake West where I would then be transported by an underground tunnel to Laurelwood, which, as far as rehab centers go, it's a pretty nice place. 
Upon my arrival, there is this soothing, nice, matronly voice calling out over the intercom, Code Violet, Code Violet, Code Violet. Sounds nice, right? Code Violet. But when they put me in the actual facility and I heard the click of the lock, it struck me that I had just made a deal with the devil. Love. Hmm. You call it whatever you want, Hope. Less than the next. How to get through withdrawals. Withdrawals are not fun, folks. Unpleasantness at its peak. I mean, I was losing my fucking mind. My muscles were in pain down into my bones, eyes watering, nose running, the most horrible kind of flu you can imagine. And I wanted to break the hell out of there, and I devised a plan to do just that. But if the cops find me roaming the streets in my insanity pajamas, where do they send me? Exactly. So it became an eight-day odyssey of vomiting, constant diarrhea, pain, and me yelling, let me free, let me free. Let me free! Let me the fuck free! Let me free. There is only one way to be free from this shit. Just one way. No, Hope. Trust me. Just one way. Eight horrible days later, it was time to move in with my dad, which didn't last long. My dad's a Vietnam vet. He put me on lockdown, took away my license, car keys, money, everything. But even still, I found ways to lie to him because, hard ass or not, I was still his child. And parents want to believe their children. Don't forget that, folks. But after the cotton fever incident, when my lips blistered over, the writing was on the wall. And sure enough, he booted me out. And I gotta say, I was pretty pissed about that. But we soldier on. Hmm. Next lesson. How to make do when your family is through. <laughs> Remember Tommy, the guy who first introduced me to heroin? I figured I'd move in with him. What could go wrong? Put the fucking knife down, Tommy. We are spending the money on crack. No, we are getting dope, period. We were at an impasse. So I ripped his money out of his hand and he came at me with a knife. I ripped his gold chain off his neck and that just sets him off. Our fight literally moves into the elevator where we start wailing on each other between floors until we reach the ground. Eventually I break my hand, bone never healed correctly, but that's okay, I got a script out of it. Percocet, <laughs> As you can imagine, our little arrangement didn't last long. I mean, we made up after that, it was just a little drug tiff, but neither of us was behaving exactly responsible and uh, definitely not respectable. Hmm. Before I knew it, I had to write a bum check to cover the rent. It was only a matter of time before our landlord would evict us. But the real problem was not our housing. It's that we were stone cold broken out of dope. So it was time to bust out an ill-advised and quite frankly outdated scam on a check cashing place. And wouldn't you know it, it worked. I have no idea why, but I didn't care. We had dope again. <laughs> no, not hope, hope, dope. We had dope again. Well then don't listen. <laughs> All right, here's the thing. I will admit I did still have some hope at this point. So I tell Tommy, look man, I'm going to treatment. I can't take this anymore, I'm going to Laurelwood. Basically, I could foresee no positive way to use heroin. Not without a place to stay. I had nothing. I was fucked and I knew it. No, not like I am now. Back then, I still had a will to live. And Tommy agreed, he's like, yeah man, I'll kick with you, but first we use this. 
Absolutely. First, we use this. So, we drive to our favorite spot, the hospice parking lot, because no one would ever think that two junkies would shoot up there. So, we're setting up, and I tell Tommy, look, man, I'm just using half because I want to save the rest for when we get to Laurelwood. No way, Tommy says. I'm not watching you use by yourself at Laurelwood. You're using it all, right now. <laughs> Against my rules, sure, but what the hell? So, we shoot it all. When I come to, Tommy's just like staring at me, like all kinds of freaked out. He's like, dude, dude, man, you OD'd. You OD'd, first you turned blue, then you stopped breathing. I went into hospice and told him you overdosed. You did what? <laughs> but of course he did, because this is Tommy, and that is exactly what he would fucking do. <laughs> I look over. Our, our passenger door is wide open. All of our paraphernalia spilling out in plain sight of the security guard who's sitting in his car. I catch his eye. Uh, I have diabetes. Guard's not buying it. I scoop up everything, haul balls towards the lake. Now, I don't know how long I was out for, but adrenaline is a powerful drug too. I get to the lake, throw all that shit in. Tommy finally catches up. He's like, dude, that security guard wants to talk to you. And I'm like, yeah, I bet he does, but I'm taking off. So we start running toward the beach, which is more rocks and sand, but hey, Northeast Ohio, right? <laughs> While we're running, my phone rings. Oh, it's my landlord. Looks like he's onto us. Ignore. Then we see some dude in a suit who clearly shouldn't be on the beach, so he's probably after us. Us. So we hide in some bushes, sirens screaming everywhere. I don't know if they're ambulances, cop cars, whatever the fuck. All I know is I ain't getting busted. Once Mr. Suit passes by, we run some more till we reach a fence we have to hop. A feat made all the more incredible by the cast that I am wearing, but we make it over. When we do, this old lady finds us hiding behind her garage. She's like, I'm calling the cops on you boys. And I'm thinking, you're late for the party, honey. So we run some more until, oh, Yep, who else? Uh, mom, uh, no, no, I'm not at work. Uh, no, I'm not sick. Uh, no, I'm not in jail. Look, I'm, uh, I'm hiding behind a dumpster on East 185th. I don't really have time to explain. Please, come and get me. Please, you have to come and get me. <laughs> and she did, because she's my mom. And you can always call on your mom, right? Because, God damn it, I'm sick and tired of putting her through this bullshit. Sick of getting her hopes up. Sick of hurting her. She doesn't know what the fuck she wants and you bring her up one more time. I'm putting you out of this room. <laughs> Lesson number whatever the fuck it is. How to be a respectable junkie for your mom when you are really a no good one. So my mom takes me in, and let me just tell you this, no mom, no mom should ever have to watch her kid withdraw. And my mom couldn't. The vomiting, the shit in my pants, the writhing in pain. So she scraped up $500 she didn't have and sent me to the Huron Road Detox which makes Laurel Wood look like the Ritz, by the way. I spend the next three days there wishing I was dead. No, the point is, I don't deserve it. When she was watching me detox, she kept asking me, are you all right? What can I do? And all I'm thinking is, unless you can go out and score some dope, there's not a damn thing that you or anyone can do. And if you don't shut your fucking mouth soon, I might just throw you through the fucking window. Yes. Jesus, I told you I'm sick. I'm fucked up and I ain't worth it. No, I'm not! <clears throat> After the overdose, I was afraid. For the first time in my life, death was real. When the counselor at the Huron Road Detox asked me what my plan was, 
All I could think of is if I go back out, I'm gonna die. And I do not want to die. Yes. I do now. But then... Then, I don't know, I didn't want to. And this woman just seems smart. Caring, I mean. I trusted her. I mean, she assured me that I could smoke there. I took her up on her proposal to go to a recovery center. The Keating Center, to be specific, or uh, the Rock, as we call it. For three months, on their own dime, they house you, feed you, clothe you, and all you have to do is show up to meetings where they try to heal you. Pretty fucking amazing, really. And it works for a lot of people. And it worked for me. For three months. Yeah, but it didn't stick. Like I told you at the beginning of this, the Keating Center is where I met Chuck. And we were instant friends because we had a lot in common. I mean, neither of us had been through the prison system. We were both from the burbs. We both loved music and both worked in IT. And the thing about Chuck is, like Tommy, he's my friend. And that means something. Because you see, in this life, you don't have friends. You have running mates. But Chuck's a good one. Like, when I couldn't talk to anybody because I was ashamed of who I was, I could talk to Chuck. He's like the only one. You form a bond like that in a place like the Keating Center, you don't forget that shit. You just don't. It stays with you. Forever. I mean, really. Chuck's a brother to me. So, me and him are getting clean together. And uh, we've been rooming together for about three months. And sure, we were white-knuckling it, but we stayed sober. Until one day... Chuck walked into our room with a bottle of Percocet, and you can do the math from there. Between the two of us, we were using $700 of dope a week in the room right above the director's office. And even in a place as big as the Keating Center, people started to notice. Why? Because we just did whatever the fuck we wanted. We weren't respectable junkies. So. After seven and a half months, I was out. Now what? Yep. Back to the woman who I won't do the courtesy of calling even now as I plan my exit. And she made things very clear to me. Either I stay clean or I was out. But still, she wanted to believe in me. I don't understand, Brian. You're a smart boy. You know this is bad, right? Yep. Then why won't you quit? She had this look in her eye, full of love, hope, sadness, Confusion and pain all at once, but mostly love. Why can't you just quit? Because I can't. I just can't. So, what does she do? <laughs> she gets me you. Thinks you'll be my reason to live. <laughs> Even named you Hope. 
which is cliche, sure, but uh, I guess she earned the right through her pain to name you whatever the fuck she wants. And soon, you'll be hers. See, the thing is, I wanted to make it work for her. Like, I wanted to believe the lie she was telling herself. So I went to meetings, and I'd relapse, and I'd go back. Hey, aren't you the guy who reintroduced himself at the last meeting? Every time you relapse, you have to reintroduce yourself. Yep, and the meeting before that. Yep, and the one before that. Yeah, motherfucker, that was me. And if you don't shake my hand and walk away and stop showing concern, I'm going to have to punch you in the face. This guy stares at me a second. Calm as can be. Hands me a phone number. This guy will take care of you. Call him anytime. And I called that number, Hope. And he was as hopeful, joyous, and annoyingly supportive as anyone can be. And I'm here to tell you that it's not enough. Because I relapse, and I relapse again. And every time for a split second, I see that look in my mom's eye when she asks me why I can't quit. And I just can't. Okay. I just can't. And I want it all to end. I want it all to fucking end. I'm too tired. And I got it all planned out. And there is nothing that's going to stop me. Not even you. Because let me make this clear. You should be thanking your lucky stars that I'm checking out and leaving you with her. Because if I didn't, I'd eventually just sell you off for a hit. Because dope addicts, even us respectable ones, we don't care about anything. I repeat, we do not care about anyone or anything except dope. And I'm too tired even for that. I can't live with it. I can't live without it. So I will just simplify things. Don't give me that look. sponsor. Jesus, he's a nice guy, but does he have to be so relentless about it? If I don't, he'll call back. Have you learned nothing? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my phone battery died, but it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I know, I, I, I had this thing at work. Yeah, so? Camp out. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't think I was invited. Oh. Uh, I thought I had to. Well, that's... That's really nice, but this weekend's not good. I, I, I mean, I don't really have the money to... Well, that's really generous, but I, I couldn't ask you to. <clears throat> well, the, the thing is, um... 
I mean, I don't, I don't know what I'd do with my dog. <laughs> yeah, I bet she would. No. No, I'll drive myself. Yes. Really. I'll be there. <laughs> I know you will. See you there. Well, Hope, looks like we're going camping. <laughs> Last fucking weekend of my life and I'm going to a sober fucking camp out. Just when you thought life couldn't suck more. You're all probably wondering why I would agree to do this. It's simple. If I don't, my sponsor will come looking for me and he'll fuck up my plan altogether. I can't allow that. I'm protecting my exit, if nothing else. I don't care about my life. You know, honestly, part of me would just like to end this now. Like, right this very second. I mean, not in front of you. I, I would turn off the camera and do it. But for one, I don't have a gun. And two, my mom is expecting me to pick her up at the airport on Monday and stranding her. It's not the respectable thing to do. And I do want to be respectable about this. That's it. Those are my lessons. Thanks for watching. After the weekend camp out, I go back home. I pick up my mom at the airport. She knows I'm using again. True to her word, I can no longer live with her. So I go to my dealers. Not the best part of town. But there's a room waiting for me. But I wouldn't be needing that. Just his gun. So first I head out into my dealer's neighborhood and I start running all around, as is the plan. Surprises me how quickly I can work up a sweat. When I do, it's back to my dealer's where I give them the news. There's some dudes, they were chasing me, man. I think they saw me come in here. They want, now, 
my dealer. He's a real paranoid dude. Always keeps a gun holstered to his hip. His hand is usually on it. You can't blame him. He's been robbed a lot. You'd be surprised how often dealers get robbed. So, when he pulls out his gun, thwack! I slam my fist hard down on his wrist, knocking the gun to the ground. He didn't see that coming. I grab it and run outside, because just like I respect my mom not to take my life in her home, I'm not gonna spill my guts all over my dealer's living room. I gotta be fast. He's coming after me. When I get to the backyard, I point the gun at my heart, and I say my final prayer, please God, let this work on the first shot. And then I pull the trigger. That was the plan. But as many of us know, God laughs at our plans. The reality, I get to the camp out on Friday night, hope with me, literally in a pup tent inside my own tent. I shoot up, I'm feeling well now. I'm ready to sit through whatever bullshit this sober camp out's gonna throw my way. I walk out of my tent and this dude taps me on the shoulder. Hey, I know you. Yeah? Yeah, you were at the Keating Center, right? A lot of people were. You were friends with Chuck? Stare at him, say nothing, right? Tall white dude, always smiling, had that funny way of walking. Ah, come on, you know who I mean. Every time he told a story, he'd end it with, you feel me? <laughs> Every time, you feel me? Yeah. So, you know then. Know what? Ah, oh, he killed himself. What? Yeah, on his dad's birthday, walked down his driveway right past his brother, got in his car and then shot himself. My breath leaves me. My stomach drops. Something in my head spins, feels like there's a satellite in there that's lost its way and now it's trying to find its coordinates. I wanna throw up, but I managed to have one thought, his mother. I remember the first time I saw her when to borrow that TV, how angry she was. What the fuck must she be thinking now? Like here I am, I'm the world's greatest painkiller and I can't handle this. How the fuck can she deal with this sober? And then I think of my own mom. I think of her getting the news of my death. How would she really handle it? It all changed right there. I tell myself I'm getting clean. I'm taking this opportunity to squeeze through the window to the other side to find sobriety. I fall to my knees. And I pray to God to make this as painless as possible. I mean, I know it's not gonna be painless, but maybe he'll give me some kind of reprieve. I go to the meeting, I sit. Listen, there's this woman from Las Vegas. She was a singer there. I listened to her lead. Jesus, she lost her daughter. They took her away from her. They had to. This is the most gut-wrenching lead I've ever heard in my life, and yet she's still here in front of us. She survived. Chuck didn't, but she... Some people have strength I can't fathom. But still, I try to fathom. And then, she begins to sing. Amazing Grace. Her voice is, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. It's like my soul is in her voice. Like her voice is carrying me. And I take that feeling back to my tent and I shoot all the dope I have left. I want to shoot it all by midnight so Sunday will be my sobriety date. And I do. I finish it. Sunday rolls around 
and I managed to stay clean. I even got an hour of sleep. Never before in the history of my attempts at detoxing did I ever sleep for an hour until this one time. So, take whatever meaning you want from that. I spend the next six months in extreme discomfort. I stay away from the old haunts, the old crew, and just go to meetings. Little by little, day by day, moment by agonizing moment, I start to feel normal again, like a person. Like I get a feel for my feelings, the whole palette of them. But even still, there are days when the sickness is too much. And I understand to the very depths of my soul why addicts go back out. Because one hit, one hit and all the pain will disappear. And we know that all too well. But I make it to six months. Fucking six months. <laughs> and now it feels like my brain has rewired itself too. Took a while, but I feel it. Then a year, then 18 months, then the day happens. I'm at the cemetery to pay tribute to Chuck, leave a cigarette on his tombstone. It is a cold winter day, typical for these parts. <laughs> when this little BMW cuts me off, <laughs> just cuts me off in the fucking cemetery. Who does that? And then I watch as the car heads straight towards Chuck's grave and this woman gets out. She starts talking to the headstone, but then her voice pitches. She starts to yell. Rant, finally in a rave, pointing over and over again at the headstone, then up to the sky, cursing heaven itself, it seems, until finally she collapses, sobbing. And then I realize that's Chuck's mom. I don't know what to do. If Chuck's fucking dead, what could I find? I'm not a real religious guy, but I ask God what I should do. What should I do? I go to her. She looks up at me, embarrassed. She thought she was alone. I'm, uh, she stands now. Surprised, her eyes big, searching. Do I know you? She says, I'm uh, I'm friends with Chuck. He was a great guy. She says nothing, just turns her head, looks down at his headstone. I do not want her to cry. He saved my life. What? When he, you know, his death. When I heard about it, I got clean. Right then and there. And I have been clean ever since. 18 months. It's the only time it ever stuck. It was because of him. And then she looks at me for what feels like an eternity. And then she just, she, uh, and I'll never forget this. She says, God sent me an angel today. God sent me an angel. And I realized right then and there what my purpose was. I am here on this earth to help people who struggle with this rotten fucking drug. 
and I would go around and tell my story to whoever and I'd listen to and if I could help just one person, just one person overcome the horrors of this narcotic and I'm not just talking about the overdoses and the deaths, I'm talking about the everyday hell that is active heroin use. If I could help just one person, then it's worth it. All of it. Chuck's mom and I are still in contact, and she says that our chance encounter turned her life around too. Up to that point, she could barely leave the house. Even when her other son was shooting heroin in the basement with his friends, she couldn't bring herself to do a thing about it. And now, it's completely changed. She works with horses. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Here's a lesson. How to take back from dope. Give back to others. It's hard to believe that four years ago, I was intent on taking my life. And here I am speaking to you. When you get involved with this drug, you know you're going to lose a lot of people. And the further you get away from it, the question of why returns. Why do you use? Why does it have to be this way? Why did you start? I think about that question a lot. That first time with Tommy. But mostly, I just think about Tommy the person. Always wearing his hoodie. <laughs> Always. He was just... He was the most generous person that I knew. So why? So many whys. But when you are holding your friend in your arms, and he's not yet cold, but no longer warm, The why doesn't matter. But still, you can't help but wonder. Why? Tommy died. On August 2nd, 2014. World dimmed a bit on that day. Before I started using heroin, I couldn't imagine how horrible my life could get. But I also couldn't imagine how amazing it can be either. And now, I'm seeing it. A couple days ago, I was at a meeting way out in the boonies. And afterwards, me and a couple other recovering addicts go to this diner. And we are just laughing, talking loud, just in general being obnoxious to the other patrons, I'm sure. When this girl I'm with says, you know, I used to spend $300 a day to feel just like I do right now. And that's when it all clicked for me. We are all just looking for some kind of inner peace. All of us. You feel me? <laughs> because you see, the thing people don't understand about addicts is, yes, at first they used to get high. But after a while, that goes away. And then they use so that they can just feel normal. Normal. I don't even know what that word means completely. I just know that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. One thing I do know, I am grateful to be alive. Damn lucky, too. Final lesson. How to be a respectable junkie? You can't. <laughs>